We thank you all for coming, particularly our people from Aramoko Ikiti. Today, Tuesday, the 14th day in the month of May 2024, may I request that we stand for the procession Thank you very much. Please, let's sit down, please. Thank you very much. You are all welcome. I want to welcome everyone to this, uh, the 382nd inaugural lecture of uh, our university, the Obafe Mwolo University, Leife. And the title of this lecture is Living Toothprints in the Sands of Time, to, to be presented by Professor Professor Murenike Uluwatoyi Ukpong is an alumnus of this great institution. She holds the fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons and a master's in business administration, master's in education administration, and a PhD. Based on the AD scientific index rating of May 2024, our H, H index is 54. This H index is the highest at the Upper Femoral University. And our 24,690 citations is the second highest in the university. She also has the highest H index as a Pedodontist in Nigeria and in Africa. And the second highest H index as a pedodontist globally. <laughs> She's rated as one of the top 3% scholar globally and in Nigeria. She holds a fellowship of the Nigeria Academy of Science. She's happily married with children. I have the single honor to introduce to you and to bring forward the inaugural lecturer of the day, Professor Murenike Oluwatoyi Ukong. So maybe... The Vice Chancellor, sir. Deputy Vice Chancellors, Academic <laughs> Administration, Research, Innovation and Development, the Registrar, the Librarian, the Bosser, Provost, Deans of Faculties, Professors, Directors, Heads of Departments and Heads of Units, Colleagues, Students, Invited Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor to start before you all today to deliver the 382nd inaugural lecture of our great university titled Living Toothprints in the Sands of Time. As you've noted, the concept of toothprints is akin to footprints, symbolizing the lasting impression we leave behind. In hearing what what Longfield's renowned poem titled A Psalm of Life, the metaphor of footprints on the sand of time is profoundly evocative, intertwining themes of mortality and legacy. Despite our ephemeral nature, 
We possess the ability to leave enduring impressions for future generations, infusing death with vitality. These footprints signify continuity, optimism, kindness, and guidance. As we journey through life, conscious of the fleeting passage of time, we are motivated to infuse our existence with purpose and contribute meaningfully to the fiber of life for those who will follow. I have opted to reinforce Longfield's motive as footprints in the sands of time. This amalgamation draws inspiration from his motive, as well as the contemporary agorical Christian poem known as Footprints in the Sands of Time. This poem depicts a person observing two sets of footprints in the sand, one representing God and the other their own. Well, this isn't scripture. Footprints in the sands of time resonate with those who discern God's promises within the lines. In my career as a pediatric dentist, I perceive these promises reflected in my journey. Through my work as a dentist, I've been able to leave behind what I metaphorically term footprints as my footprints. Importantly, these footprints are left in rather than on the sands of time, symbolizing the journey that acknowledges God's promises hidden between the lines. This prelude serves as my contemplation on the motive of this inaugural lecture. Emphasizing the distinction between in and on is not a grammatical error, but rather a tribute to the guiding hands of destiny that has led me to this point. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I proudly stand before you today as an alumna of this esteemed university, reflecting on the unprecedented journey that has led me to this podium today. As detailed in my inaugural lecture notes that I've shared with you, my path into dentistry was marked by unprecedented turns, including my adolescent temper tantrums in the hands of my father, who wanted me to study medicine rather than methodological engineering, and, the, and my own personal transition from orthodontics to pediatric dentistry as my professional focus. Little known as the fact that I actually started my residency as an oral and maxillofacial surgeon at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Ijaraba, Lagos. However, fate intervened, directed me to embark on a new journey in Ilefe as a pediatric dentist. Initially, I started work without compensation until Providence, in the person of my very own uncle here, intervened and once again secured me a position on the payroll. Further twist of fate led me to secure a position at this esteemed university, despite initial setbacks and challenges. I faced the threat of a dismissal, actually, from this university because of my unauthorized consultancy, which I undertook. But these experiences profoundly shaped my understanding of failure. Through adversity, I learned value, valuable lessons in resilience, self-esteem, and character development. And the collective efforts of parents, teachers, families, and peers have also contributed to laying the foundation of this beautiful day for the living indelible footprints in the sands of my own time. Of note is the profound influence of Professor Steve Odusoya, my esteemed teacher. I'm certain he would be surprised to find himself prominently featured in my life's narrative, as I do not think he would call me his mentor but he definitely will call me supervised sin. Unbeknownst to him, however, is that the quality of grit, resilience, discipline, and the relentless pursuit of excellence that he instilled in all the students had profoundly influenced my professional growth. Through his guidance, I internalized the importance of maintaining focus on my objective, despite encountering failures and setbacks along the way. Rather than viewing failures as obstacles, I learned to perceive them as invaluable lessons for growth. And from Professor Dusoya, I gleaned that excellence should be the baseline standard for life. I also learned the significance of adhering to disciplined work ethics as part of routine practice. I have got to discover that the practice of pediatric dentistry requires one to be an embodiment of all these values that were acquired through life. Similar to how mentors shape the lives of mentors, pediatric dentists have the privilege to make enduring impressions on their patients who often evolve to become cherished friends. I recall with fondness the daughter of a lecturer I had to manage under general anesthesia for dental phobia. 
She would not get into the dental chair, and when she did, she was always out of the chair in a few minutes to use the toilet. She was the first child that I ever had pediatric oral health procedures for in the theater, and it was a lot of planning. With her, I learned the valuable lesson of using this sensitization technique in dentistry. I worked with her through multiple sessions, and it was indeed a great pleasure to receive an invitation to our marriage several, several years later. I'm sure she's doing exceptionally well with her family, as I'm sure she would recall the values of patients from my experience in the dental clinic. As a pediatric dentist, you patiently guide the child patient to achieve success with his or our health behavior change agenda. Together, we celebrate every little success and we help our patients learn how to turn obstacles into stepping stones for success. In addition, we hold the remarkable ability to positively impact the lives of children through the integration of arts into the science of the practice of pediatric dentistry, thereby restoring oral health by building the confidence and self-esteem of children in our care. Pediatric dentistry is a world of dental sciences with pre precision meeting art history. From the delicate nuances of restorative dentistry to the ever-evolving landscape of dental technology, I will explore with you today the transformative power of the cutting-edge research that embraces innovative dentistry, thereby redefining the boundaries of dental excellence. Here at Faculty of Dentistry, Oba Femi Awolo University, we have exemplified this dental excellence excellence, thereby gaining national recognition for the exemplary standards of pediatric dental care that we provide and global recognition for the outstanding research that we conduct. We pride ourselves as our innovative approaches to revolutionize the dental experience for children, thereby enhancing their oral health outcomes and overall well-being. Allow me to highlight some of these transformative encounters resulting from the integration of science with art here in Ilefe. In our pediatric dental clinic, we cater to children ranging from 0 to 16 years, and this encompasses five different age groups, namely infants, toddlers, preschoolers, school-age children, as well as adolescents. Each of these age groups present distinct developmental and psychological requirements. And one not worthy aspect is that although parents accomplish their chil children to the clinic, we tailor our approach to managing pa parent-child dynamics different for the five different age groups. This customized child care strategy is informed by psychological principles, ensuring that we address the unique needs of both children and parents effectively. First, we know infants and toddlers share a strong dependency bond with their parents and therefore separating them from their parents doing dental care can provoke anxiety in the child and may disrupt management. Unfortunately, at this de developmental stage, their brain functions is not sufficiently advanced enough to comprehend the meaning of things like, it is not painful, it's just pressure, and thus we rely on the trust that these young children have built with their parents, particularly their mothers, to be able to make a success of their treatments. So what we do is keep the child comfortably seated in their parents' lap while we'll provide care, striving to transfer the trust they have with their parents to us as their dentists. And all the while, we as dentists primarily communicate with the parents and occasionally interact and show friendly gestures towards the child. However, the approach changes for the preschool and school age children aged three to nine years. While still connected to their parents, the children are beginning to assert their independence. So in the dental clinic, we allow them to stay seated in the dental chair while the accompanying parent sits in a separate chair within the treatment cubicle. In addition, dentists engage in direct communication with the children and cross-reference the information gathered from the parents. Furthermore, the use of behavior management strategy becomes very critical for this age group. Behavioral management strategies are particularly effective for this age group as they become targeted at cognitive reorientation, leading to improved compliance with instructions especially doing invasive procedures such as administering dental anesthesia 
or performing extractions, or when a child exhibits signs of anxiety or fear, we employ a combination of behavioral techniques. This may involve engaging children in conversations while examining their mouths. We provide detailed explanation of the procedure in an age-appropriate manner, offering praise for cooperative behavior and tactfully ignoring destructive behaviors. Additionally, we we'll sometimes enlist the help of those children present in the clinic to model appropriate behavior for their peers. My colleagues and I have spent some part of our clinical career years to study how to maximize the effectiveness of the use of the strategies to enhance the experiences of children in the dental clinic. And we have made a huge success of the stealing through our research at Ileife and effectively administering these techniques in ways that we rarely have children crying while attending the dental clinic in Ileife. And this is not an ordinary feat. I choose to celebrate the success that the dental clinic in Ileife is known for, acknowledging that it is a result of translating many of my research findings into clinical practice. Adolescents, on the other hand, exhibit unique behavioral patterns. While advancing cognitive development, uh, while uh, um, adolescents have advanced cognitive development, as well as bogering independence, they often perceive themselves as adults. And though they are not truly independent of their parents, they want to be treated as being independent. And therefore, in the clinic, we somewhat re um, engage with them independent of their parents, despite the economic dark tie that necessitates parental consent for treatment. And directly engaging with the adolescent is essential as we need to delve into personal and confidential topics to effectively plan for their care. During consultations, we inquire about various aspects of their life, including sexual activities, social interactions, substance use, and spiritual beliefs. These inquiries are important as numerous research endeavors by my team and I have highlighted the profound influence of social factors on adolescents' oral health, and as detailed in page 10 to 16, and illustrated by figures one, two, and three in the inaugural lecture notes that you already have with you, I showed that the oral health of the adolescent is intricately intertwined with their social dynamics, which significantly impacts their mental, sexual, and reproductive health well-being. Worse still, poor oral health and general health in adult life often starts with poor oral health in adolescence. And although the inquiries directed towards adolescents may, may seem intrusive, they are important. As pediatric dentists with counseling skills, we initiate counseling sessions with adolescents when we observe that they may have maladaptive behavior. And these counseling sessions enable us to reinforce positive lifestyles and address emerging risk behaviors. And two of those risk behaviors that emerge in adolescency is tobacco smoking and alcohol consumption. The research my team and I have conducted provides evolving evidence that not only smoking and alcohol consumption on the increase among adolescents in Nigeria, but ironically, there is no more sex differences in the use of non-tobacco smokes like vamping and electronic cigarettes, like it was, it was once worse. And the impact of these two risk behaviors on oral health is huge. Dentists therefore are trained on how to break this habit. And this habit, once again, emerged during adolescence. Adolescent oral health is an emerging field and a field I am working to pioneer in Nigeria. One of my strategic goals is to leverage the field of oral health platforms to enhance the overall health and well-being of adolescents. And by addressing the complex interplay between oral health and broader social determinants, my team and I aim to contribute meaningfully to the holistic health of these demographics. Not only are we trained as guidance counselors and psychologists, but often we pediatric dentists also have to play the role of social workers. It is imperative for us to remain attuned to the social context of each child as we encounter and tailor their management strategies accordingly. 
As outlined in the Nagra lecture material I've already shared with you, pediatric dentists strive to maintain a healthy social equilibrium for children to optimize their oral health care outcomes. And this entails addressing a spectrum of issues, ranging from managing temper tantrums and navigating parental separations to mitigating the impact of food insecurity on oral health, thereby reducing the risk of neglect and abuse. Furthermore, we implement measures to facilitate children's access to dental care and miss parental challenges. Recognizing that oral health can exist in, cannot exist in isolation from social care, we have innovatively integrated these dimensions of care into dental practice and the training of students in a fair. Consequently, our school curriculum emphasizes the importance of social partnership and networking to provide comprehensive support to children and families. I vividly recall a case detailed in my lecture note where we encountered an unusual instance of recurring acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis a condition often linked to malnutrition. Such recurrence is unprecedented in our clinical practice and we had never found a report of such. Adding to the complexity of the situation, the child arrived in the clinic with her sister rather than a parent. Upon further inquiries, we learned that the child held from a broken home, the mother was dead, and the father was unable to provide for their care. Consequently, the responsibility of caring for this young preschooler fell on the shoulder of the sister. And this led to their domestic existence, with children often seeking shelter in churches and other accessible spaces. At first, our clinic supplied them with vital food provisions. Nevertheless, our main priority centered on securing ongoing care for both children. And collaborating with a colleague, we facilitated their transition into an orphanage setting. As a result, the child never made a subsequent visit to the clinic. And this case serves as a pungent reminder of the intricate obstacles encountered by vulnerable children and underscores the indispensable role of comprehensive support structures that pediatric dentistry may have to facilitate access to to safeguard the welfare of the children in their care. In addition to serving as social workers, we pediatric dentists have to informally learn to match science with creative expressions in multiple ways within the pediatric dental clinic. The integration of arts with science in pediatric dentistry is multifaceted. It involves blending precision with empathy and also effective communication and combining creative treatment methods with evidence-based practices and utilizing visual aesthetics to enhance patient's comfort and satisfaction. As detailed in my lecture notes with you, pediatric dentist embodies the principle of STEAM, and this is an acronym of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And we emphasize the importance of cultural considerations in scientific inquiries so as to dismantle biases and promote inclusivity. Within this discipline, cultural diversity is not only recognized, but also celebrated as a critical determinant of outcome, outcomes and patients' experiences. This approach leads to more personalized and equitable healthcare, addressing any disparity that may arise from cultural insensitivity or lack of cultural awareness in healthcare practices. We have incorporated visual arts into our practice. The pediatric dental clinic stands out as the most vibrant and colorful area within any dental facility. And this is intentionally so because we need to create an inviting and a reassuring environment for the young patient. The vibrant hues, playful de um, de decorations, and captivating visual elements are strategically employed to alleviate anxiety divert attentions from patients' fears, and instill a sense of joy and excitement, thereby enhancing their overall dental experience. Moreover, the lively ambience serves to cultivate trust among the child and the dentist and the dental team, fostering a positive association for oral health care for this young age. For those of you who may have been um, to the dental clinic before, you may have observed that we do not discharge patients from the pediatric dental clinic. Our aim is to encourage regular return visits at least once a year. 
And this allows us to reinforce education, pro pro um, promptly identify and address any oral health issues, and correct any unfavorable behavior that may have developed. This approach ensures comprehensive and ongoing care for our young patients. I recall a particular case of interest that involved one of our regular pediatric patients who consistently visited our clinic with a cheerful de demeanor. However, there was a recurring issue. The dental restoration of this child kept falling out. And despite employing various scientific techniques and methods to retain the restoration, this child will come back at the next visit with a dislodged restoration. Subsequently, my colleague decided to directly inquire from the child about why the feeling was falling out. The young girl confessed that she had been deliberately removing the restoration using pins because she enjoyed visiting the dental clinic. <laughs> this anecdote serves as a testament to the success of her approach in Ileife. Regrettably, that marked the last time she saw us in the clinic. And this underscores the importance of parents' awareness about our intention with children to ensure their experiences are positive and they would return for their follow-up visit eagerly. In addition to our focus on social and vital and visual arts, we also incorporate performing arts in our practice. If you have visited at the dental clinic in Ileife, or if you have visited any of the clinic where our trained residents practice, such as Enugu and Benin, you might have experienced what I hear by time, the pediatric dental clinic clap performance. And they will do that right now. <laughs> Thank you. As seemingly straightforward as this performance may appear, it stands as one of the most potent tools we have developed at the dental clinic to foster cooperation among our young patients. We celebrate each of their successful behaviors with these claps, which they genuinely cherish. And this serves as a powerful motivator for them to continue exhibiting positive behaviors throughout their treatment. As the session progresses, the club becomes louder and more festive, culminating to a joyful celebration upon the completion of their treatments. This practice is actually grounded in well-established psychological phenomenon. Children thrive on praise. We express admiration for their accomplishments, accomplishment through various means, including clapping, presenting certificates of good performance, offering hugs and pats, and hosting lively celebrations at the conclusion of their treatment. Consequently, the last interactions with the pediatric dentist becomes a profoundly positive and memorable, memorable experience for the child. And this deliberate approach represents one of the distinctive future between pediatric care and adult care. Children tend to recall the last memorable events they experienced and making it essential for us to purposefully leave them with a positive and lasting impression as they depart the clinic. In contrast, adults remain fixated on the one negative experience that they, one negative event they experience. I want to emphasize the importance of nurturing children's well-being and development. We've encountered numerous challenging cases involving children who have experienced repeated disappointment due to unfulfilled promises from their parents. These children were promised rewards for exhibiting good behavior, only to, that, only to have the promise unfulfilled. And as a result, they have developed a distrust for adults, and they distrust us as pediatric dentists. And so building the trust of these children takes considerable time and effort. And allow me to illustrate this with two examples. First, I distinctly remember a situation at a dental clinic where I treated a pair of twins. One of the twins required a treatment involving the use of local anesthesia, while the other one only needed preventive care. As we proceeded with the treatment for the first twin, the second one observed attentively, witnessing the administration of local anesthesia. It was remarkably easy to establish trust with this child. However, what struck me most about this experience was the reaction of the second twin, who kept crying and insisting on receiving the same local anesthesia. 
In effect, what she watched and what is often perceived as a dreadful experience and was, and was likely asking for this because there was no hint that the procedure could cause pain. It was quite a remarkable moment and one that left a lasting impression for me. The second incident, however, was a rather sobering one. I encountered a school-aged child with numerous cavities in her mouth who was deeply fearful of dental procedures. She adamantly refused to even sit on the dental chair. And despite employing all behavior techniques that I knew, I could only coax her to allow us to use a mirror in her mouth after two visits. And she had undergone past traumatic experiences. Considering the severity of her condition and her extreme anxiety, I believe that general anesthesia was the most appropriate course of action. Unfortunately, I encountered challenges in securing the necessary approval to provide her with treatment under general anesthesia. And regrettably, she never returned for her third visit. And the memory of this child saw a deal haunted me for a long time. This case served as the catalyst for me to in initiate collaboration with the Department of Anesthesia to establish a sedation clinic. And our sedation clinic in Ilefe has since become a highly successful management practice, garnishing recognition throughout Nigeria. The Department of Child Dental Health is immensely grateful and proud of the fruitful collaboration we share with the Department of Anesthesia to start and sustain the practice of conscious sedation. And we actually pu published our innovative views of ketamine for this procedure. Gladly, this practice continues to thrive till today. As you may have discerned by now, pediatric dentists play multifaceted roles and it extends beyond traditional dental practice. Not only have we acquired skills and knowledge to proficiently practice all the nine specialties in dentistry, but we have also learned to adapt these skills to address the five different age groups. More so, like medical doctors, we have had to facilitate access of children to essential dental services. During my tenure as head of department, I did get approval from the chief medical director of the hospital, who is gallantly seated here today, to implement differential pricing for dental care services at the pediatric dental clinic. This approach address, ad, aimed to address the financial constraint faced by some patients by offsetting their treatment costs with fees that we charge affluent patients. Dental care services in, Efe, in the Efe is renowned for its affordability without compromising on its quality. And this, the position, and this positions the hospital as one of the most cost effective providers of high quality oral health care in Nigeria. As a result of our accessible pricing structures, we attract clients from neighboring states who could pay higher fees care. And so what we did is increase the price of services for clients who look to reach so that the cost differences covers the cost of free treatment that we provide for less privileged children. This and differential pricing strategies allowed us to ensure that no child left our dental clinic in Ilefe without receiving the necessary dental care, which may have resulted otherwise from financial constraint. Regrettably, however, this practice was not sustained after my tenure as head of department. However, we continue to instill this philosophy of care in our students, emphasizing the importance of ethics and justice in child care. We believe that pricing for care should, be cons should consider the social context of the community served by the clinic. And even private practice can maximize profit while supporting access to care for the less privileged. Public health clinic like ours in Ilefe has the responsibility of addressing existing disparity in healthcare, which often favors the wealthy over the poor. Oral health problems among children are increasingly recognized as a justice and human rights issue, as those most affected are often those limited um, by economic means, they have poor access to health insurance, inadequate information and education, and numerous other barriers to care. It is imperative that we continue to advocate for equitable access to dental care to address the systemic inequalities and promote the well-being of all children in the community where we reside. I was prompted to embark on a journey before, beyond the confines of clinic walls in recognition of the profound impact of social vulnerability on oral health and the intricate interconnectedness of poor oral health with various other societal issues. 
I realized that while the clinic served as a critical venue for addressing issues of oral health needs, it was akin to continuously mopping up water from an open tap without addressing the source of the leak. I felt compelled to broaden my efforts by actively engaging in public health initiatives aimed at preventing oral health problems at their very roots. And my experiences and endeavors outside the clinic walls allowed me to maintain firm foundation in dentistry while expanding my skill set as a social activist, an HIV campaigner, and a community bioethicist. I began to integrate my role as a child dentist with public health orientation, recognizing the importance of addressing broader social determinants of health. And in the next few minutes, I will discuss about building expertise and competency to address social issues effectively. It is crucial for researchers to recognize their capacity to effect social change and to actively embrace the roles they are as elites, as researchers that have the power and the influence for change. With our advanced understanding and knowledge, we have a responsibility to leverage our expertise to catalyze meaningful social change and improve the well-being of individuals as well as communities. Having dealt with the socially vulnerable population of children for years, I was adept to becoming a voice for the voiceless. And as a woman myself, I intimately comprehend these vulnerabilities. I am accurately aware of how limited access to education perpetuates a vicious cycle of poverty and oral health problems for both parents and children. A recent publication of mine underscores this point. It demonstrated that globally, preschool children of mothers with less than three years of secondary school education are at heightened risk of dental caries. And conversely, ma maternal access to tertiary education serves as a protective factor against poorer, poor oral health outcomes. The advocacy for women's education predates the Beijing Conference. And with my own family as a testament of the transformative power of education, my maternal grandmother, steadfastly de steadfast determination ensured that my mother and her female siblings received an education. My paternal grandmother was favorable to my auntie here with me today to pursue a degree in electrical, electrical, and elect, elect in this university. And my PhD thesis explored, explored gender issues in the medical and dental research enterprise. The disparity in access of the female child to education is still with us today. Sadly, the story about how the impact of oral health, our education impacts and affects oral health is poorly told. Poor maternal education negatively affects the oral health of the child. And access to oral care is also hindered by stigma and discrimination. And this is experienced by minority populations. It leads to social exclusion and the lack of support. Children also do not have access because of exploitation and abuse. In my inaugural lecture notes that I shared with you, I detailed encounters with a young girl exhibiting the symptom of being trafficked for social exploitation, as well as a male patient who presents unusual injury accompanied by suspicious individuals. This distressing case underscores the urgent need for protocols to identify and support vulnerable populations within the dental care. Through a collaborative research I, I conducted with colleagues from 26 countries of the world located in six WHO regions, it yielded insight into the dear need for a protocol to address child abuse, especially child oral health neglect. In the interim, I remain committed to extending my efforts beyond the clinic walls to address the complex social issues affecting vulnerable populations and effecting meaningful change. Outside the clinic walls, I work with advocates to translate research into policy, policies and programs. It's about pushing to shift the care paradigm from one that is primarily public health focused to one that is also right-centric and enhances personalized care. White right-centered care approaches prioritizes the need of every individual. The public health one focuses on the collective well-being of the majority. My advocacy work aims to harmonize these approaches, recognizing the importance of individual rights and yet the broader public health context. What I do as a researcher 
is to generate evidence that empowers my friends and peers in the civil society space to execute their mission effectively. Leveraging on my research expertise, I have engaged in various areas of public health endeavors, including HIV, Ebola, COVID-19, sexual reproductive health, and mental health. And over time, my focus has expanded to encompass the impact of traditional and indigenous knowledge on access to care, including oral health care. My interests remain focused on vulnerable populations and such as preschool children, adolescents, individuals and women living with HIV, key populations, and sexual and gender minority individuals. Recognizing my position as a member of the club of academic elites, a de designation applicable to anyone here in a university setting, I am committed to leveraging this privilege to create platforms for sharing evidence. By disseminating research findings, I'm able to influence policy development and inform practices that promote the well-being and wellness of marginalized and stigmatized communities, as well as that of minority groups. I collaborate with teams whenever they allow me to, extending my presence into policy discussions where I contribute my expertise. In the reflections I've shared with you in my inaugural notes that should be with you, I've highlighted several instances of this impact and the efforts I have made. Among them, and the one I take a lot of pride with, is the collaboration I had with my colleagues leading to the lowering of the age of consent for non-invasive sexual and reproductive research in Nigeria from 18 to 14 years. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my central point here is that the combination of scientific knowledge and advocacy can be a powerful force for driving social change. Achieving effectiveness in science requires active involvement with stakeholders, thereby enabling the rapid transformation of scientific findings into practical actions. However, in the realm of oral health, the translation of scientific evidence into actions tends to be slower compared to other fields. Nevertheless, it's crucial to expedite translation of scientific knowledge to oral health and oral health to actions because the impact of oral health on general health and the quality of life is, I mean, it's, it's proven beyond doubt. Research that solves real world problems need advocates to act on them to fast track real world solutions. Research conducted by the academia needs to evolve from one that merely gathers publications for career advancement to prioritizing publication that has a tangible social impact. And the university, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, needs to be actively invested in translating its staff research outcomes into national policies and programs and not leave this for the staff to do. The university must be seen and nursing the staff research outputs and working with it for national change through a system that the university can develop. And I'm willing, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, to work with you to develop the system. As an advocate for change, I urge for increased involvement of researchers from diverse fields in the into the realm of oral health. I have endeavored to emphasize that the pinnacle of pediatric dentistry lies in the blend of scientific rigor with artistic sensibilities and a compassionate touch. This call should inspire the extinct scholars gathered here today to contemplate how they can contribute to building a solid evidence base to enhance oral health. Just as I, a pediatric dentist, have ventured into various domains, leaving my marks as toothprints all disciplines can draw connections to pediatric dentistry and contribute meaningfully to its advancement and leave whatever prints that you want to leave behind. I make a critical call today for a singular reason, to underscore the, to underscore the growing body of evidence linking oral health to overall health. The ramification of poor oral health extends far beyond dental issues. It increases the risk for type 2 diabetes. It exacerbates the outcomes of stroke and cardiovascular diseases, and it contributes to adverse pregnancy outcomes. Recently, my team and I published an article shedding light on the concerning finding 
untreated dental caries in the mouth of children may lead to adverse cognitive and neurodevelopmental outcomes, with pathways suggesting significant implications for the young child. Consequently, the negative effect of poor oral health outcome might manifest much earlier in life than previously acknowledged, potentially impacting the children before they become adolescents. To address this issue comprehensively, we must prioritize early childhood health initiatives aimed at promoting growth and development. And by so doing so, we can mitigate the impact of long-term consequences of poor oral health, including preventing suboptimal brain development in young children. This underscores the urgent need for a holistic approach to oral health that encompasses not only dental care, but also the broader health initiatives targeting early childhood development. In Nigeria, advancing oral health necessitates a concerted effort across both the formal and informal fields. Currently, school-based oral health programs face limitations because only approximately 60% of primary school children that should be in school are in primary schools. 40% of secondary school children that should be in school are in school. And only 18% of those that should be in tertiary institution are in tertiary institution. And therefore, when you initiate projects that are school-based, we all have very limited impact. To truly make a difference, we may have to devise innovative and contextual relevant approaches to reach individuals in both formal and informal settings, such as religious places. It is assumed that these religious places house a lot more children and adolescents than we otherwise can find in schools. And therefore, this begs for those in religious studies to actively engage with, with, with we pediatric dentists to develop engagement models for children's oral health using religious platforms. As I draw my lecture to a close, I'd like to share a brief reflection on the significance of mentorship and legacy building. My adoption of Longfield's metaphor, now recasted as toothprints in the sands of time, extends beyond my contributions to paradigm shifts in pediatric dental clinic practice or translation of epidemiological research I've undertaken in collaboration with colleagues, which has informed policies and practices at the national regional and international levels. Tooth prints symbolizes my role as a pediatric dentist in influencing and shaping lives for the future. Much like my own path was influenced by my mentors. It embodies the deliberate action taken to inform and insti instigate change by working alongside and advocating for others. It reflects our capacity to effect change, extends beyond the confines of clinical settings, determined instead by our willingness to step beyond or within those confines and take actions. The lecture notes I shared with you before now reflects on the values of mentorship and how I have been inspired by great minds. Today, my aim is to inspire everyone to acknowledge their sense of scientific legacy lies in nurturing the next generation to mentorship. Mentoring involves guiding aspiring professionals through the complex terrain of their respective fields while emphasizing the ethical obligations inherent in their professions. The dynamics between mentee and mentor fosters an environment conducive for curiosity encourages innovative thinking and ignites a strong passion for professional growth. It's within this relationship that the seeds of future successes are sown, where young minds are nurtured, and where the legacy of knowledge and value is passed from one generation to the next. And through mentorship, we leave whatever prints we would like to leave. Hopefully, we leave prints that would withstand the weathers of the storms of life. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I repeat that my presence on this podium is a testament to the invaluable guidance I've received from exceptional mentors during my educational journey within this esteemed institution. It is incumbent upon each of us to embrace the mantle of mentorship with humility and unwavering dedication. 
in addition, I extend an invitation to my peers and colleagues across various disciplines to explore groundbreaking opportunities within dentistry. Within dentistry, there exists a vast landscape for scientific inquiries, administrative ad ad analysis, educational exploration, environmental examination, and legal scrutiny. We encourage researchers to direct their focus towards dentistry for innovative research ideas that have the potential to make significant contribution to the field and beyond. The Faculty of Dentistry stands prepared to serve as a conduit for international collaboration. Together, we can cultivate research expertise and exchange fresh insights, foster a collaborative environment where new knowledge is generated and shared. Through collaborative efforts, we can forge new pathways in research and reaching the global landscape of dental science and, and practice. To me, Toothprints symbolizes a commitment to legacy building by making a lasting impression through clinical practice, research endeavors, and advocacy efforts that serves as a source of inspiration for future generations of the dental profession. It reflects a steadfast determination to foster continuous progress and improvement in dental care, education, advocacy endeavors, ultimately benefiting both individuals and the community. In effect, you do not have to be a dentist to leave footprints. The essence of footprints lies in the desire to perpetuate one's influence by impacting knowledge skills and values to others, ensuring that the work in the field of dentistry initiated continues to thrive long after one's time. But then, what are those dreams I would like to see perpetuated for dexterity's sake? Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I dream of mentors who can chart new terrains to reach for research exploration across diverse domains, particularly within the realm of oral health, by spearheading innovative inquiries into oral health of preschool and adolescents, have unveiled numerous uncharted frontiers of knowledge in oral health and healthcare. Key among my landmark research areas is the investigation of the intricate connections between macro-level variables and early childhood caries, a disease that affects 514 million people around the world and the 10th most common oral health problem in children. Investing my time to study about early childhood queries is a worthy public health investment. And I've published over 50 manuscripts, including my novel piece of work, <laughs> linking the 17 sustainable development goals to the etiological factors for queries. This piece of work is novel showing global researchers that dental health is much more beyond the Sustainable Development Goal 3. This, I hope, will enable oral health mop up more resources from the other 16 SDGs to support the needed urgent work in this area. I also dream of a legacy in pioneering healthcare evidence on optimal strategy for integrating oral, mental, sexual, and reproductive health through the lens of implementation science that my mentees and theirs can continue to expound. I have three pioneering manuscripts published on this team and working with peers to seek grants to support its implementation. My dream is also to see my mentees joining me in pushing the boundaries of knowledge, particularly in providing evidence for the implementation of personalized dental care for children through community health initiatives. I have published over 15 manuscripts that explore pioneering thoughts on engagement with the communities in planning, implementing, disseminating, and translating research outcomes to policies and practices and, ha and have some understanding of how this works. I also dream of handing over my current research work on understanding how traditional and indigenous knowledge can be unrehearsed to enhance access and uptake of oral health care in Nigeria. This piece of work of mine is still in its infancy. Sadly, my research reveals a significant lack of emphasis on oral health by traditional health care prov providers which poses a considerable obstacle to improving oral health outcomes in rural areas. It is imperative for all healthcare stakeholders at the community level to understand the intricate link between oral and general health and prioritize oral health as a gateway to overall health and well-being. I envision my 
mentors fraternizing with national policy makers, contributing to policy development, and developing an impactful national oral health program. Despite the existence of a national oral health policy that is 12 years old, Nigeria lacks a comprehensive national oral health program. While individual dentists, professionals, students, state and national dental associations have done commendably well in terms of pushing the frontiers of oral health into the community, the absence of a systemic tracking mechanism impedes our ability to gauge the progress. This discrepancy underscores the urgent need to, for collective action, both from dentists and non-dentists alike, to advocate for the establishment of a national oral health program, catering for the different age groups across Nigeria. I foresee my mentors fulfilling our role as global players, engage in international research collaborations and knowledge sharing endeavors to address global oral health challenges. Nigeria stands as one of the primary producers of oral health related data for Africa alongside Egypt and South Africa. However, Africa has the lowest publication rate on oral health, coupled with a minimum impact and the minimum citation. This reflects the need for a more deliberate approach to research. I therefore dream of all faculties in this university investing in collaborative research with the Faculty of Dentistry so that Opa Femi Awolo University can have an outstanding reputation of producing quality life impactful research on oral health. I currently work with peers to start the Oral Health, health Network in 2022 to drive this agenda. And this platform is open to researchers in Africa who would like to address the oral health problems in Africa. It's about Africa for Africa. Please feel free to discuss this body with me. And I am open to discussing with interested persons who would be able to assess a wide range of network of early career researchers spread across Africa who they can work with. In my vision, I aspire to be part of the establishment of an oral health research center dedicated to addressing oral health disparities across African countries. The center would collaborate with local communities, governments, and healthcare organizers to develop sustainable oral health programs with a lasting impact on oral health and well-being of individuals, community, and the society. And by designing interventions that address gender and social inequalities and fostering the development of early career researchers competencies, we can pave the way for cutting edge research and future policy initiatives. IFE can build on its legacy in pediatric dentistry to build a research center for child oral health care. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I now bring my lecture, Leaving Footprints in the Sands of Time, to a close by noting that it serves as an invitation to each one of us to recognize the transformative power of margin science, arts, community engagement, and advocacy for social change. Together, we can shape a future where our contributions endure, inspiring generations to come. Let our footprints leave an enduring mark on the narration of progress, compassion, and positive change. By uniting our efforts, we can create a tapestry of influence that resonates through time, guiding those who follow in our footsteps. Each of us all the power to contribute to a collective legacy that transcends individual achievements. By nursing our unique skills and passion, we can pave the way for a more enlightened and equitable future. And at the end of it all, the many who have followed in the footprints, like the many who have followed in the footprints of the Grandmaster, the Lord Almighty, and made a success of their profession and their race in Christ, may he take all the glory as we leave the replica of his footprints in the sands of the lives of men. Thank you for listening. Now the presentation of certificate.
Thank you very much. Well, this is uh, the first of its kind, and it's like uh, it's uh, a sort of innovation. Uh, I'm presenting this certificate on behalf of uh, Obafemi Memorial University, Leife. A certificate of presentation of inaugural lecture. This satisfies that Mure Nike Uluwatoi Ukpong, a professor of pediatric dentistry, the Department of Child Dental Health, Faculty of Dentistry, Upper Pemolo University, Leif, in Nigeria, delivered the 382nd inaugural lecture titled Living Toothprints in the Sands of Time on May 14, 2024. Congratulations.